Hello, historians. I'm your host, Heather Ashley, and welcome to another episode of Whose Line Is It Anyway? Just kidding. Women of history. <laughs> we finally got our podcast. <laughs> nice. Because I'm Wayne Brady, if you couldn't hear from my voice. A podcast dedicated to celebrating women who have made or are making their mark on our society. Please give a tepid welcome to my co-host, Bert. Uh, uh, tepid i like that thank you i've only ever gotten that um from my mother yeah. oh so shout out to mama ortiz shout out to mama mama burt mama burt mama burt <laughs> yeah no ernie just burt today oh boy yeah yeah i could my partner's not here this but is, how's your day going this is off the rails I, it's my fault i started it this way but i love it i dig it that's the energy today um i'm doing well Happy yeah. spring. Happy spring. For sure. Mm. So I don't think we have any morning announcements, do we? Any no I'm, business? I don't think so. Bert is ready and eager Bert to is learn. Ready. <laughs> so for today's history lesson, we are going to be talking about a civil rights and women's rights activist, educator, and inspiration to all, Mary McLeod Bethune. Oh, yes. I actually, I did a Twitter post, uh, a morning morsel about her uh, mm. for our Twitter, which, by the way, go check out our Twitter. <laughs> at uh, of, of, The uh, Herstory her, Pod. Her, de- definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I know a little bit about her. Um, so I'm interested in, to see what new information I'm going to be picking up from. Uh, I love it. From, from you today. I love the enthusiasm. I, I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm all ears. Quote, A woman is free if she lives by her own standards and creates her own destiny. If she prizes her individuality and puts no boundaries on her hopes for tomorrow. That sounds like how you live your life without (laughs) even realizing it. Oh, well, thank you. What a compliment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Mary McLeod was born on July 10th, 1875 near Maysville, South Carolina. She was the 15th of 17 children to former slaves Samuel and Patsy McLeod. After the Civil War, her mother worked for her former owner until she could buy land to grow cotton of their own. By the age of nine, Mary could pick 250 pounds of cotton a day. Whoa. I know. I can't Um, even fathom. I, I hate that that's, like, a fun fact, because it's not so fun. Not fun at all. <laughs> Child labor, Bad not fact. a good time for anybody. Wrong fact. At age 10, Mary was actually given a rare opportunity to be formally educated. She was enrolled in the one-room Trinity Presbyterian Mission School, where she was taught to read. Goodness. And later in life, she said that the whole world opened up to her once she learned how to read. I I I'm I'm glad that they, that there was that opportunity that one room though I, I can know. just imagine the, the summertime with the one fan that mm-hmm. like is just like probably not even a fan really. like hardly moving it's yeah. just uh, I feel spoiled now I being, know. having I know. like I'm central like, air I have and no AC. complaints I'm like man <laughs> no just one fan two fans maybe <laughs> tops what <Yeah. laughs> no I'm so sorry. Her family was deeply religious, and she ended up attending and graduating from Scotia Seminary, a boarding school in North Carolina, in 1894. She attended Dwight Moody's Institute for Home and Foreign Missions in Chicago, Illinois, for a year. It is said that during her time at the two religious institutes, she developed her philosophy of, quote, female uplift and a passion for educating girls for leadership in their communities. That's excellent. That's even before the... You said... So that's right before the 1900s. That's like Mm -hmm. a couple of years before. Right before the I think that's really good to add. Like, that's like a good bar Mm -hmm. to to be able to set. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So early on. on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agreed. Unfortunately, no churches wanted to sponsor her as a missionary. So she decided to become an educator instead. Quote, the drums of Africa still beat in my heart. They will not let me rest while there is a single Negro boy or girl without a chance to prove his worth. Mary's first teaching job was at the Haynes Institute in Augusta, Georgia. Then she transitioned to teaching at the Kendall Institute in Sumter, South Carolina. I love Augusta. Augusta is so pretty. We should go there next time we're in Georgia. Yeah, for sure. Shouts out Georgia. (laughs) 
While teaching in South Carolina, she met and married a fellow teacher by the name of Albertus Bethune. The two had a son in 1899. Aww. The young family moved to Palatka, Florida, where Mary worked at a Presbyterian church and sold life insurance. Mm. I know. She's a woman of many hats, you'll yeah. find. In 1904, Mary opened up a boarding school, the Daytona Beach Literary and Industrial School for Training Negro Girls. I- I'd also like to point out that she doesn't mind the warmth, because as, <laughs> as the stories progress, she went from North Carolina, <laughs> Like a mile Georgia, behind, she's just making Florida. her way south. She's like, I need the tropics. She's like, yeah, and then <laughs> she opened up a school in Mexico, and I'm like, Wow. <laughs> <laughs> she was going for that equator warmth. <laughs> that equatorial warmth. <laughs> so while she was working on opening up this school, she was unfortunately dealing with the tumultuous marriage that she had with Albertus. Their marriage ended in 1907 when he abandoned the family and returned to South Carolina. The two never officially divorced, and even though he didn't die until 1918, she listed herself as a widow in the 1910 census, and, like, I'm putting words into her mouth when I say this, but I hope that she did that because he was dead to her. <laughs> I hope she was like, and you're dead. She didn't know the term dead to, dead to me, so she was like, he is deceased from my vicinity. Yeah, and I am a widow. And I am no longer, yeah, and I am no longer partner <laughs> and then 2020 it's based 2021 is that yep, yep. is that lingo that we, yeah. quote in each experience in my life i have had to step out of one little space of known light into a large area of darkness i had to stand a while in the darkness and then gradually god has given me light but not to linger in for as soon as the lights had felt familiar then the call has always come to step out ahead again into new darkness I I love that. I love that she just her whole and you'll see this as a theme in her whole entire life is like she is she's never in one place too like uh, too long. She gets comfortable and she's like, all right, we got to I'm getting I'm getting too comfortable. We need to to expand and step into the new darkness and bring light into that darkness. So it's no longer dark. Yeah, I was I was going to say I'm seeing like a lot of I'm I'm seeing I'm rather I'm hearing like i'm hearing that from someone who has gone through mm. a series of tribulations mm-hmm. and who is still kind of going through it mm-hmm. um and it's 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 both motivating mm-hmm. to to see people to hear people even like oh, over 100 years mm-hmm. ago who were going through the motions and then kind of being like we're persevering mm-hmm. but there's still x amount of obstacles that we have to absolutely like, look, but like, it will never remain darkness for long every, you know everyone's been everyone has had hurdles for mm-hmm. us and you know forever in time and mm-hmm. so and everyone's been able to go through them mm-hmm. more or less yeah this, of course know, situationals yeah you know depends but mm-hmm. yeah yeah Her incredible boarding school ended up growing and growing and becoming a college after successfully negotiating a merger in 1923 with the all-male Cookman Institute. Thus, the Bethune-Cookman College was born in 1929. She was now the president of the school and still remained accessible to provide mentorship and to support men, women, and college students that needed it. Okay. Okay. As her status inevitably grew, she never used her access to people of power and privilege for her own personal benefit. She always used it as an opportunity to gain access for those shut out of opportunities in our society. She enlisted leaders of government and industry to support her vision and dream of social justice and changes for the school and beyond. Yeah, it's important to have those people who will be able to open the doors for uh, everyone who Mm -hmm. hasn't made it out yet, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, to to have uh, a woman like that in power is... I mean, you know, especially at that time, even now would be Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. sowed to, I guess, the next set of generations to come, you know, that like after her that Mm. would take up her reign and like make sure that the doors continue to Mm -hmm. stay open and that there are better doors to open. Mm -hmm. Quote, we live in a world which respects power above all things. Power intelligently directed can lead to more freedom. 
unwisely directed, it can be a dreadful, destructive force. Absolutely. Yeah. See, that quote is mm-hmm. great. Yeah. I mean, if in the wrong hands, it's just... It's awful. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's chaos. We have many exhibits right on the tip of our tongue. <laughs> yes. Bethune worked with numerous organizations on the local state level. The Florida Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, where they founded a home for delinquent black girls in Ocala, Florida. She was the president of the Southeastern Federation of Colored Women's Clubs from 1920 to 1925. And she worked with the National Association of Teachers in Colored Schools from 1923 to 1924. She was active. In these groups, she organized fights against school segregation and in, and inadequate health care for black children, among obviously many other things. In 1924, she was elected the 8th National President of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Yeah, I think I remember that. Mm -hmm. I think I remember doing research on that. That's really cool. Her previous extensive administrative experience served her well in managing the day-to-day happenings of the 10,000 member association. More than qualified. (laughs) She grew the organization. She fundraised. And she began to formulate plans for an umbrella organization, an organization that would not only focus on making women better people and more rounded, but help them to become actual agents of social change. In 1931, Bethune was 10th on a list of the most outstanding living American women. Oh, wow. I know. How do you think compile about... that list back then? I know. <laughs> and she used this platform to push publicly for racial and gender inclusion. And I really, really tried for a long time to locate said list. I'm... And I could not find it. But it's in a national archive somewhere. Look, I, and I'll find it. I'm not in my 30s yet. I won't lie. So I'm, I'm not too sure if they had Google and Jeeves back then. <laughs> but I'm not too back sure. Back in 1931? Um, I don't know. Heads or tails, whether or not, you know what I mean? I think the I think the jury's still out on whether 50, 50. or not technology maybe, maybe was not. usable. <laughs> but I don't think you could appropriately make a list back then. I don't then. know. I mean, they made... I she, if she, The fact that she was on the list as a black woman during this time in the 30s, already she was being recognized. She was no, being right. seen. No, of course, but that's because she had... Was she in the made, public eye. She did right. so many great things, mm-hmm. and and those things made her at like like put her at you the forefront of mm-hmm. what she was doing. I wonder if there were other women. And I mean, I, I guess you could probably hypothesize. <laughs> yeah, on, honestly. And I... I mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. So interesting. On December 5th, 1935, Mary Bethune was unanimously elected the founding president of the National Council of Negro Women, a council of which we spoke about um, a few episodes ago, if you want to look um, in our February episodes. Anywho, she served in this role until 1949. Mary played a huge role in transitioning black voters from the Republican Party, that was the Lincoln, the party of Lincoln, right. to the Democratic Party during the Great Depression. This is when everything sh- flip-flopped. Right. Under her leadership, the NCNW grew to over 850,000 members. And today, more than 4 million members continue her work. Quote, to those of you with your years of service still ahead, the challenge is yours. Stop doubting yourselves. Have the courage to make up your minds and hold your decisions. Refuse to be bought for a nickel or a million dollars or a job. Woo! Uh, know your worth. <laughs> know your worth. Yeah. Understand but your also, value and make sure bought. that you are undervalued. Yeah. Make sure that you, yeah, you mm-hmm. are getting uh, appropriate, like, everything that mm-hmm. you get coming to you. I exactly. Mean, you like, know, you, if don't you be undersold, it, but also don't let yourself get bought. Especially in this field where Do there's, work, like, someone yourself. telling you that you are worth X amount. Question how, question that person. Question how they got into power. Mm. And question, like, what it means for them to give you, uh, mm-hmm. to, to, like, mm-hmm. be saying that. Because you could take it with a grain of salt. You could, if it's someone that you look up to, then mm-hmm. that's great. But if it's someone that maybe you don't and they might have an ulterior motive or just, you know, whatever, it's... Yeah, hold it, it, hold your decision and don't let yourself be influenced. Like be take the criticism, so like yeah, yeah take the criticism, just... but know where, know who it's coming from, and know what place they're coming at you. Nothing from. Nothing should, and also mm-hmm. nothing should ever be only received at face value because right. there's always a, there's always a second layer, mm-hmm. second and third layer of meaning behind there's whatever thing else. Mm-hmm. Just like a just like a Marvel movie, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Just one division. Yeah. Every line means yeah. two things. Yeah. <laughs> Gentle reminder that during all of this, she's still serving as the president of the Bethune-Cookman College. You she was doing everything at she's the time. She's <laughs> the president of a college, a civil rights activist, and a leader of women. So, yeah. of course, she's gaining national attention. And from a lot of prominent people. This is like in 40 years, too. In 40 <laughs> years, she's been the president and leader of like a handful of, of different organizations. That's amazing. Mary served as an advisor to Presidents Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover. Was- Under Hoover, she was appointed to various commissions that advise the president on labor and youth employment as well as education. That makes them, I'm so happy they did that. In 1936, President Franklin Roosevelt appointed her to special advisor to the National Youth Administration. She performed so well that FDR created her a department of her own, and she was named the Director of Negro Affairs on the National Youth Administration. This made her the first African-American woman to lead a federal agency and made her the highest paid African-American in government with a $5,000 a year salary, which is a little over $94,000 That's 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 incredible. That's honestly so incredible for her to not only Mm -hmm. be making that, but to have like... To have had an opportunity to work under and two administrations is something three. is under three administrations is something that like you might see it now, but only if it was like Bush Jr., uh, Clinton, and Obama. Mm-hmm. Like not that many. There are a handful. She but was so not that many, especially during this time mm-hmm. as a black woman. Pro- like mm-hmm. no, that no, just did not, not happen in the United States. She was States. really close to the Roosevelts. She was like. Very close. We'll get into it. I hope. We'll get into it. Yeah, please. The NYA... We're going to backtrack a little bit first. Yeah. (laughs) The NYA employed hundreds of thousands of young African-American men and women. They also established the, quote, Negro College and Graduate Fund. This fund supported over 4,000 students in their quest for higher education. Quote, invest in the human soul. Who knows? It might be a diamond in the rough. Mary was the leader Mm. of FDR's unofficial Black Cabinet, a term that Bethune coined in 1936. That is, that is, that is so what's up. I love her. I am. She's so. She said, nah, this is a Black Cabinet. Please understand. (laughs) The Black Cabinet worked on lynching legislation, attempted to ban poll taxes in the South. And they worked on welfare, among many other issues. That's so dope. (laughs) And I want to talk about voter suppression in the South for just a minute. It started early. And by that, I mean from 1890 to 1910, 10 of the 11 former Confederate states passed amendments in their constitution to disenfranchise black people and poor white people with poll taxes, literacy and comprehension tests, as well as residency and record-keeping requirements. In Louisiana, by 1900, registered black voters reduced to 5,320, even though they made up the majority of the state's population. Then, Just 10 years later, by 1910, only 730 black people were registered. Yeah. Less than 0.5% of eligible black men. Quote, uh, this is a quote from um, a a different source. This isn't a very quote. Uh, Quote, in 27 of the state's 60 parishes, not a single black voter was registered any longer. In nine more parishes, only one black voter was. And if you can't vote, you can't serve on a jury or run for local office. Up until like the late 1800s, there were there were still black people running for office because they they, they, these men were allowed to like register to vote. But they made it so difficult that it wasn't that it literally one like some parishes had zero black voters registered at this point. Now, most of the nation's black population still resided in the South at, during during this time. And sure. this was the most efficient way to legally keep an already oppressed people under the power of greedy white men. Then, quote, this oh. is a quote from Mary. She said, forgiving is not about forgetting. It's letting go of the hurt. During the New mm. Deal era... Mary and other council members worked to increase opportunities for African Americans. The department was able to grow and get incredible work done due in part to Mary's access and relationship to FDR and the First Lady. The cabinet laid the political groundwork for the modern civil rights movement. 
When World War II rolled around, Mary was involved in mobilizing support for the war effort among African Americans. In a speech she delivered in 1941, she said, quote, Despite the attitude of some employers in refusing to hire Negroes to perform needed, skilled services, and despite the denial of the same opportunities and courtesies to our youth in the armed forces of our country, we must not fail America. And as Americans, we must not let America fail us. I'm telling you. She's... Oh, come on. I know. This is so disrespectful. I know. I don't understand. Yeah. She said, e- we don't even care. Like, you're yeah. racist. We understand you're racist. We have a duty to fail yeah. as a people. Mm-hmm. They said, forget your racism. We're yeah. going to move past it right yep. now because there is a greater thing yep. than your petty... Yes. Petty. Yeah. Petty. I know. Ideology. I know. Get that out of here. I know. It's 2021. I'll strike the... <laughs> God, I'm so high. I'm so heated right now. I'm His- so <laughs> Historian Audrey Thomas McCleskey said, quote, despite the numerous instances of racism shown toward her and even unsubstantiated charges that she was a communist sympathizer, Bethune maintained her belief in America. Damn, I get triggered every time we I know. say we say something about racism. That's crazy. I know. It, it, these I know. women have to go through so much, mm-hmm. and it's like in the history, mm-hmm. it's in the past, and here we are. I know. Oh. Mary led war bond drives, blood donation drives, and encouraged African American women to staff canteens around the country. She was appointed an honorary general of the Women's Army for National Defense. And when the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps converted to active duty status in July of 1943, she served as an advisor for the new Women's Army Corps. In this position, she lobbied President Roosevelt to end segregation in veteran rehabilitation centers, and she briefed him on instances of violence against black service members in the South. So she's like taking notes. She's like, yo, FDR. I, I'm just saying in comparison to like now. It's like oh, there's, yeah. st- there's like still what, so many still issues. Could, yeah. Right. I mean, there's like a handful of things yeah. he could have done. This man was sick also, if we, yeah. if we remember the yeah. time period. Mary remained extremely close to FDR until his death. She attended his second, third, and fourth inaugurations. And if you feel confused, I did too, because I had entirely forgotten about the fact that he was the first and only president to serve more than two terms. Because they liked him so much. He was a, such a good president that yeah. like everybody was like, no, we'll still keep him. We still like him. FDR, yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, the course. 22nd Amendment was passed by Congress in 1947, and it was ratified by the states on February 27th, 1951, to limit all presidential terms to two. I just kind of felt like putting that in there because I had forgotten that whole part of history. Man, imagine only Ooh. winning just once. <laughs> She was delivering a speech in Dallas, Texas, when his death was announced on April 12th, 1945, and she immediately flew to Washington. And then she later participated in the nationwide radio broadcast that celebrated FDR and his legacy. That must have been, that must have been, like, an an event, you know, Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So she even walked around with a cane of his. So oh. that was like he like gifted her his like i one of his like iconic canes and and she used it all the time. That's and really sweet. I know. I just I love I love that that was a a friendship. public public friendship. Mm-hmm. A very public. It wasn't like behind closed doors. I'm friends with black people. It was like it's like a, Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. <laughs> yeah. Good friends. <laughs> Ebony and Ivory. What a song. <laughs> Bethune was appointed by President Harry S. Truman as the only woman of color at the founding conference of the United Nations in 1945. So this is what, five, four, five? I can't imagine she's done. (laughs) She sounds like, that sounds like something you're going to be. It sounds like that that level, that like, that lane of like, I'm going to do everything everything. in 50 years. Yeah, she's (laughs) like. 55 years. I have to accomplish everything. Every I need to be thing. friends with every president. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jeez. She focused her efforts on the rights of people living in colonized countries around the world. Oh, that's amazing. She reportedly left the conference feeling disappointed as she didn't get the concessions of freedom, human rights, and self-determination that she had desired. Quote, World peace and brotherhood are based on a common understanding of the contributions and cultures of all races and creeds. She's just mic dropping with every freaking word she says. She's got gems. Ugh. 
another friendly reminder that she is still the president of the Bethune Cook College. Active president, mm. like still doing real work there. I don't understand. <laughs> in 1949, Mary was invited to Haiti to receive the highest Haitian civilian honor, the Medal of Honor and Merit. She also traveled to Liberia as a representative of President Truman. Here, she received their highest medal, the Commander of the Order of the Star of Africa. I'm glad, I'm glad she's getting these awards. Mm-hmm. That's good. Mary retired from her active role as the president of Bethune-Cookman College in 1947, and a few years later, she left her role as president of the NCNW in 1949. There is a memorial statue of her in Washington, D.C. that was erected in 1974, and in 1985, she was put on a postage stamp. Mm-mm. Her final residence is a national historic site. Once she retired, she spent the rest of her days at her home, which she called the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> now known as the Mary McLeod Bethune Foundation National Historic Landmark, it is located on the campus block of her beloved school. Until her death, she entertained national leaders and foreign dignitaries. She inspired and mentored men and women and spoke on current events. She died peacefully in her home on May 18, 1955. The Daytona Evening Newspaper published the following after her death. To some, she seemed unreal, something that could not be. The lesson of Mrs. Bethune's life is that genius knows no racial barriers. She is buried on the school's campus. She received 11 honorary degrees from both both black and white colleges. One from Rollins College, making her the first African American to receive that honor in the entire South. Yeah. I'm... (laughs) Wow. Woo! On top of her incredible work in education, civil, and women's rights, she wore numerous other hats, one being that of an unofficial historian. She would chronicle African American history, envisioning a permanent and growing collection of black women's contributions to the world. Story's got to be told, right? And you got to make sure mm-hmm. the person is doing And it's all documented to... and it's there. Yeah, like mm-hmm. that's great. She was a dear friend of Dr. of Dr. Carter G. Woodson and served as the first female president of his organization. She was the first female I'm president of, She's of just every everything. organization that she was in and that's that's <laughs> That's boss status. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, Associ- <laughs> the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History Incorporated is is the association. And, you know, just because, of course, she did this. Like, of, of course. Of yeah. course. She was involved in various projects to preserve the history of African-American women and the documentation of their achievements. The Mary McLeod Bethune Council House NHS includes the National Archives for Black Women's History. Something that I didn't really know how to integrate um, throughout the script was the specific social climate of the time, namely the Jim Crow laws. Right. So they were in action for her entire life. Sure. The Jim Crow laws were enforced until as late as 1964, when the separate but equal laws were overruled by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Thank you, LBJ. <laughs> The name Jim Crow Laws, it it stems from the Jump Jim Crow. It was a song and dance caricature of black people performed by a white actor, Thomas D. Rice, in blackface. It first surfaced in 1828 to satirize Andrew Jackson's populist policies. Because of Thomas Rice's popularity, Jim Crow, by 1838, became a derogatory expression for Negro which is already a derogatory expression when it's being used. So it's just (laughs) pouring salt and acid into a wound. So naturally, the the, the racial segregation at the end of the 19th century that targeted black people was deemed the Jim Crow laws. Now, these are, I mean... Racism was wild yeah, I, back then, and it's kind of taken a new life now, but... but like, I, I, it, there, there were things where um, there were uh, uh, accounts of, like, when she would roll through the South, somebody said that even the uh, 
the chickens knew to run away because everyone was going to be preparing her up a, a as best a southern feast as they could. And another one was like, um, he was like, we were in the car and you have to like have a list of, of the stations that allow you to stop and fill up your gas tank. Oh. Right? Because some of them don't serve oh. black people. Oh, because... You know, can't have a black person touching your thing. But she kind of like, it it was just a whole, whole thing where she, I guess, didn't float above it because she wasn't above it. It was just um, people were more in passion to, to be part of everything she was doing. Sure. Because, because in spite of all these um, limitations that were put on her, she was like, that's fine. I'll find a. I'll find a way on it. It's like the quote earlier where she's like, "Forgiving isn't about forgetting. It's about letting go of the hurt." And she's like, "This hurts me, but we're gonna let it go because I have better things to do." Yeah, like just incredible. Her last will and testament reads like an epic poem, and I want to read for you all uh, her closing paragraph. It's a little lengthy, but it's worth it. I promise. I leave you, finally, a responsibility to our young people. The world around us really belongs to the youth, for youth will take over its future management. Our children must never lose their zeal for building a better world. They must not be discouraged from aspiring toward greatness, for they are to be the leaders of tomorrow, nor must they forget that the masses of our people are still underprivileged ill-housed, impoverished, and victimized by discrimination. We have a powerful potential in our youth, and we must have the courage to change the old ideas and practices so that we may direct their power toward good ends. Faith, courage, brotherhood, dignity, ambition, responsibility. These are needed today as never before. We must cultivate them and use them as tools for our task of completing the establishment of equality for the Negro. We must sharpen these tools in the struggle that faces us and find new ways of using them. The freedom gates are half ajar. We must pry them fully open. If I have a legacy to leave my people, it is my philosophy of living and serving. As I face tomorrow, I am content, for I think I have spent my life well. I pray now that my philosophy may be helpful to those who share my vision of the world of peace, progress, brotherhood, and love. That's, that's a, that's beautiful. I, I'm so... Her whole, that is like not even like a a, a quarter of, of her, of her last will and testament. And like the, the fact that she's just like, I'm going to use this space to say like... We need to save the. We need to help Ugh. the future generations, and you know, I, I was thinking don't about it. Don't discourage them. Don't hog the power for yourself because you're gonna die. You know, this isn't for you. This is for the people after you. I feel like, and and I, I, I feel like this is kind of true that like when you're, I feel like marginalized individuals are so much more selfless because they know the value of a dollar and and what it and what. The repercussions are for not having that dollar. Mm. So if you see someone struggling, you're more you're more than likely to like lo- give them a dollar, like Empathy. give them some food. You, you've yeah, because it's, yeah, it's a level yeah. of We're of like, saying, "I know that struggle. Yeah, I know that life. Yeah, and I'm here for you." And I think it's just something I just love that her whole thing is like. <laughs> It's all. It needs to be all about the next generations after you. Like, of course, if, that's how it uh, should be. It, it because yeah, like. Oh, I don't know. Just I, and it I ex- still have chills. It doesn't <laughs> I excuse got up, like, people who have anything to not give anything. Like if you have more to give than other people, and that can is, just even mean you ha- time. You have like, to just like give your in time. any form. But if you have more than the next person, you need to give something up. Like this is not up for debate. Yeah. Like this is there is like there is an ebb and flow to the way the world works you know nature environment mm-hmm. like everything there's an order there's a natural order in life and if you don't end up just putting that sort of energy out there you will not get that back later on yeah Promise no you. it's like everybody will, no one will look yeah. out for you and no one will yeah. think of you like that yeah. when you pass you will be that person that no one like yeah. thinks about because you didn't do this you weren't this person yeah like, and that's not to say you have to live 
you know, a life like she did in terms of like, wow. But that's just to say, yeah, like give she what didn't you can, put the focus on One of everything. 17. One of 17. I know. Isn't that insane? That's insane. <laughs> and to, and, to be, and her parents were former slaves too. So it's, and she's like nine years old, taking 250 pounds of cotton. To have had the opportunity to go to two different institutions, to yeah. learn, have a good education. That was her whole be thing. Be president of several different think, organizations and have the mental wherewithal mm-hmm. to say, I'm going to give back. Well, I think I think something that she focuses a lot on, and I, I think this has to do with her being so passionate about education. That's so much of what good teachers are, you know, where they're like, I'm passing you all of this knowledge. And for her, the entire world opened up to her when she was given the opportunity, a rare opportunity to be educated, to learn how to read. Because, like, you know, otherwise all those doors are closed. Yeah. They're just flat out closed. Right. And I think for her, she's like, I know that if I had not had this, these people say, here's this opportunity, mm-hmm. I would not have made it where I have and we would not be making these changes. Right. And therefore, literally one person, one one person Takes made one this person. much of an impact. Takes one person it's just to, crazy. To, to make any to sort just of recognize. Effect. Recognize it's the a ripple potential effect, in something. You know, with yes. energy. It's like you do something and then you Absolutely. pay it forward. And then next thing, you know, the next person does that because you did that for them. And then they're going to do that. And then mm-hmm. the world is just going to be a better place if we all just, you know, kind of live life like that. You don't, no one's saying to give $100 or $50. It doesn't even have to be $5. It yeah. could just be don't, you know, if someone's having a bad day. Don't make it worse. One (laughs) nice thing could change the whole. You don't know what kind of day day that person was having. They might have had like a whole mental breakdown. Might Mm -hmm. have had you know financial issues, familial Mm -hmm. issues. One little nice thing could make someone's day, week, month, year. Absolutely, they could feel like someone sees them mm -hmm. and that they won't feel hopeless or you know or defeated or Mm -hmm. like no one has their back. So Mm. you know, damn, all that is to say. Uh, she's incredible. She she's 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 a I boss. Loved she's a boss her. bee. She's yeah. she's a boss bee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A boss buffoon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Trademark, copyright, <laughs> quoted, exclusive. You heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you, historians, for tuning in again. Subscribe, follow, put up the bat signal. Come back this Friday for an interview with Susanna Davta, the shoe consultant. Yes. In this interview, she tells us how she got into the shoemaking business, tips for you to start your own shoe company, okay. and so much more. Yeah, I might make some. Follow our... So you might make some. You're going to start a shoe shoes. brand? Burt shoe Burt brand? shoes. Shoes by Burt. <laughs> I don't want those. Mm, exclusive. Follow, follow our social media. TikTok. Burt. <laughs> at Her Story Podcast. Instagram. At Women of Her Story Podcast. Facebook. Women of Her Story. Twitter. The Her Story Pod. And visit our website at ofherstory.com Whose line is it anyway? Not mine. (laughs) Until Friday, be safe, stay healthy, and show the world what you're made of. Wear a mask. Bye. Get out of here, Bert. Bye. You're fired. Aw.